Good morning. Let's do it one more time, just for me. Good morning. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to need a little bit from you to keep me going this morning. But if you have your Bibles, open up with me to Mark chapter 12. We'll be in verses 35 through 44. Mark chapter 12, verses 35 through 44. And it reads this way. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng or crowd heard him gladly. And in his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and have places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Let's pray. Jesus, we ask for you and all of you and nothing less. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. It seems as though the church is a constant headline in various news outlets and in our world today. It doesn't take much than a Google search in the news section to see the various articles, some titled for good, and others titled for ill, the church being a place that is corrupted or engaged in politics or just the ordinary care of the needy and the most vulnerable among them, the preaching of the Bible, etc., maybe even scandal. What our world sees often is a church that isn't serving others, but is self-serving, an empty faith, and it hurts. Or they could see a hope-filled preaching of a message of good news that heals. The reality is, though, the former is on display more than the latter. And it can be a confusing image for us inside the walls of the church and for those among us or those outside of us who don't quite believe that the church is what it's supposed to be or that it's even a thing. The reality is we personally have seen it too, right? People can easily attempt to co-opt Jesus and make him either organizationally as a political puppet or a personal gain in their world or help them with societal positioning in certain places. And on a personal level, he can agree with our decisions. He can support our causes. He can help us live a little bit more comfortably And in some parts of the South, he's just another name on a resume 
when you come to speak in certain places with certain people. In his classic work, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis, through an interaction between uh, two characters, one Wormwood and the other Screwtape, builds out this concept of Christianity and. And what he means by Christianity and is Christianity in addition to something else. What he's saying is that when somebody is encompassing Christianity and they are intrinsically binding together Jesus and well, my personal preference, the status I want to have, a, maybe a country or a political leaning. This is what Lewis calls Christianity and. And so you see in the beginning though, in the garden, God did not intend for there to be an and. He intended for us to take him as he is, to live within the reality that he created, which was himself, and to walk with him, and to have that shape our being as a people and as individuals. There was no God and, there was only God is, and we lived in it. And the reality of that is that gospel doctrine, what you believed about God and gospel culture were always flourishing. They were always connected. They were always operating as one. There was never a separation. But we all know, and we've all felt it, the deception and the reality of sin has really torn apart what God intended to be good. And he's made it it's made it in such a way that we don't inhabit God's reality, but God, if we believe in him, inhabits ours. And it's with this that we step into the context of what Jesus is doing in the temple. You see, Jesus has entered the city of Jerusalem. They're calling him the Messiah. They're praising him as he, as he comes to the temple, and he goes into the one place of worship that matters the most, his father's house. And he's not met with flourishing and with healing and with worship of God, but he's met with what seems to be manipulation, deception, questioning of him, of him taking advantage of people. And it's here as we look at this text, Mark 12, 35 through 44, that we can begin to be reminded of maybe even experiences that we've had with the church, with Christians at large. And this can provoke within us the question of what does Jesus desire for the church? Or more personally, what does Jesus desire of me, of you. So Mark 12, 35 through 44 has the answers to our questions, but specifically it has the answer to what does Jesus desire of you and of me. So look with me now at verses 35 through 37, and let's explore what does Jesus desire of me? See, we enter this scene with, with no more questions being asked of Jesus. In verse 34, he answered everything wisely, and it says, nobody asked any more questions. So what's happened now is they've stepped away from the stage, and Jesus has stepped up to the mic. He's got the, got the ring. He's ready to, an, to ask the question. And he doesn't pull any punches. He poses a question pointed toward the scribes and what they teach about the coming Messiah. He says here, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter. What the entire engine of faith runs on is who is this Messiah? The answer would have been universally accepted in antiquity and amongst Jew the Jewish culture. They would have believed 
that the Messiah was the anticipated king through the Davidic line, the one who would draw them out from under the oppression of their oppressors, which in that time was the Roman government, was Rome itself. The Christ in the mind of the scribes and of the people was a human son who was supposed to sit on a human throne and help them conquer human enemies and be liberated from human oppression. But the reality is, is Jesus, he was that man. He did come from the line of David. But he wasn't just a man. So he then continues by affirming the divine inspiration. You see it there. He says, David in the Holy Spirit declared, which means that Jesus, what Jesus is about to say is that this is coming from the very mouth of God. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. You see, he quotes Psalm 110. And then the next question he asks here is the conundrum for all the people to answer. And it's even something for all of us to answer. He says, David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? So what is Jesus doing here? He's leaning in and he's expanding their categories of what this means that the Messiah has come. The phrase, the Lord said to my Lord, is key to this scene. We know that the crowd and the scribes expected the Messiah to be a man, to inhabit a throne of the Davidic king. But did they expect him to be more than just a man? The first Lord here speaks of God himself. And the second Lord here is the Messiah. And so God, Yahweh, is speaking to God or the Messiah, Adonai. The Savior who was promised through the Davidic throne, the one who would lead God's people out from under their oppression and establish his rule forever. But if David's son, implying that his descendant, to which Jesus was, wasn't just a human descendant, everything changes for them. Everything. Jesus calls to their attention and to ours that David's son cannot just be a human if David himself says, he is my Lord. You see, each of the Davidic kings, they lived. They kind of did some good things, and they disastrously failed, and then they died. Jesus is not like David. He's better than Jesus is telling us that the Messiah, the one to save humanity and the world, is much more than just a man. He is also God's son, the one at the right hand of God since the foundations of the world, the one who will put the greatest enemy under his feet. And this enemy isn't just an earthly or human enemy. This enemy is sin. Satan and death. You see, Jesus is trying to expand their categories that what they're looking for in a Messiah is more than just something that will be of worldly concern. It's one that will expand even broader, cosmically, that will crush sin, Satan, death, and hell, and will cause redemption for the entire world world. So Jesus is the Messiah, God incarnate, in all of his glory, present in the temple, and he is publicly displaying that the one who asks the question is the answer. He is the God-man. He is present, and he is in control. He is Lord. A possible reason, potentially, if you, as you remember, John preached last week on the greatest commandment, and a possible reason that, he, that Jesus responds to the scribe saying, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven, 
could come down to the way he viewed Jesus. So what, what does a Jesus desire of me? What does he desire of you? What does he desire of his church? What we see in this opening scene is Jesus desires us to see him as he is. Nothing more, nothing less to take him as he is. In this scene, Jesus has stepped up to the mic. He is present in the midst of the crowd and he is making it plain to them who he is. This has been the goal of Mark's gospel all along for you and I and the crowd and anybody reading to see Jesus as God. A God present in the midst of history. A God in complete control of what's happening. What hope do we have if Jesus is just a man? Even if he's just a slightly better man than you or I. We could get by for a bit, I'm sure, saying, oh yeah, he's a little bit better than me. I can look to him. He doesn't mess up as much as I do. We need something more than just a man. We need someone to bear our burdens when the nights are long, the days are hard, when the world is chaotic. We need someone who can bear our failings, sin, and shame when it shadows us moment by moment. In all reality, if Jesus is just a slightly better version than us, he cannot save us. He cannot redeem this world. So for redemption to shape our hearts and this universe, for forgiveness and honor and love to be our reality, we need Jesus to be who he says he is. They needed Jesus to be who he says he is. We need for him to be God. So Jesus is laying claim to everything by asking this one question that we all must answer. Do you know who the Messiah is? Do you know who Jesus is? And will you see him as he is? So if Jesus is saying he desires for us to see him as he is, and you maybe see him as he is, what difference does that make? And this is where the next two scenes come into play. So look with me now at verses 38 through 40. So what does Jesus desire of me, of you? Let's explore this together. So as Jesus continues to teach, the crowd is drawn in. At the end of verse 37, he says, the crowd received what he said gladly. See, this happens often throughout the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus says something and the crowd's like, yes, that's what I want, that's what I agree with. So he's got their attention. They're taking notice. And what he does is like a good grandfather with an attentive child, he tells them a very specific part of the story. He speaks more pointedly about the scribes. He starts this statement with be aware or beware. The force of Jesus' words could easily be passed over here. We could just read by it and say, beware of the scribes, right? But there's a pressure to it. There's a push to it. There's a force to it. There's a pay attention to this. Another way he could say it was look, see what's happening among you and actively turn away from that. What he's about to describe to us is what he doesn't want us to be, what he doesn't want his church to be. You see, the scribes didn't accurately see Jesus as he was. If they did, things would be different. In fact, Jesus wants to make it clear that if they did see him, it would have changed everything. As Jesus makes his case, he begins to look at the external trappings that the scribes really cared about. See, the scribes used their wardrobe to show off exactly who they were when they were out and about and within the temple. When they went to the marketplace, 
They looked for greetings. Think about a military high official going into the barracks and immediately they, the troops stand up and they salute him for who he is and what his rank is. Or if you're a Seinfeld fan, think about Maestro, Bob Cobb, who, because he was a conductor, he said, you need to say to me and you need to greet me as Maestro, not Bob. That's what they were want. There was a pretense to it. There was, I need to be known for who I am, where I rank. They would look for the most important seats, which signified in the temple, they would get the seats that were outside of where the people would be. They'd be on the edges, on benches, looking at the people, not with the people. There's a sense of honor and of privilege there. And finally, Jesus points to their desire for places of honor at banquets. Or in other words, if they were going to a dinner party or a house party, they got the closest seat to the host with all the fine trappings because they were the honored guest. They were the ones that mattered in the place. This is all showing us upward mobility to which the scribes desired. The goal in all this was to assume and consume as much honor as humanly possible to feed their pride. But Jesus doesn't end his teaching with, okay guys, this is wrong, don't do it. No, he goes further. He describes to the crowd the spiral effect of pride. He says, they devour widows' houses. Throughout the Bible, God makes it a point to care for the widow, the orphan, the sojourner, the most vulnerable among you. James in James 1:27 tells us that true religion is to visit the orphan and the widow. But Jesus is showing the crowd and he's showing us the spiral effect of pride. It can lead you to devour others and especially overlook the most vulnerable and the most in need in your sphere of influence, in your life, in your church. And our pride, our hearts are divided. We cannot love God fully and be fully self-serving. It's as if they turned the greatest commandment earlier into love yourself with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and take advantage of your neighbor. Now, at this point, I do want to make notice that some of you among us have been on the receiving end of a devouring. There's something that needs to be said here which Jesus is openly against. For those of us who have been devoured at the hand of another's pride, even a ministry leader's pride, you need to, you need to hear, Jesus, he says to you, I see you. Come to me. Take my yoke. My burden is not heavy. I will give you rest. And then he says, look at the end of the verse there in verse 40. He says, they will receive the greater condemnation. He says, justice will be served. You will not be missed. He won't stand for the bruising and the battering and the exploiting of his sheep. So what does Jesus desire of us? What does Jesus desire of his church? He desires that we be aware of our pride. Now the thought that might run through your heads at this moment is, okay, I'm glad I'm not like them. But instead of running to compare ourselves against the scribes, I want us to think a much, a much higher. I want us to compare ourselves to someone else. So where the scribes wore garments for status, 
Jesus came from heaven as a baby. He grew up with no status. Where the scribes sought greetings in the marketplace, Jesus was found in obscurity. With comments like, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Where the scribes grabbed the most important seats, Jesus stood among the people, healing and teaching. Where the scribes dined in the most famous and with the most famous, Jesus ate with tax collectors, sinners, and more, granting them honor. Where the scribes devour widows, prayed long prayers, and will receive condemnation due to their pride, Jesus willingly gave his status, was devoured and condemned on behalf of the sins of the world. What I want to say to us is, yes, beware of the scribe in us all, but look at Jesus and beware of the scribe. But as Jesus desires for us to see him as he is and be aware of our pride, shouldn't there be an aim to all this? Where is he going with it? What's, what's the good in it? This is where we come to verses 44, or 41 through 44. So look with me now. What does Jesus desire of you and of me? The scene here now shifts. And Jesus has moved from teaching the crowd to the courts of the women which is the court outside of the court of the Gentiles, which is where he flipped the money tables. The text says he sat down opposite the treasury. Within this court, there would have been multiple receptacles of offering boxes for so many people to go and give their offering to. It's here that Jesus sits and he observes. He observes the hustle and the bustle of what verse 41 says, many rich people putting in large sums. So when his eyes scan the court as he hears the clanging of the coins of large sums of money come in and he locks his eyes on a poor widow. Pause for a second and consider what's happening here. Jesus is God. God just finished teaching this crowd and he's in the temple and his eyes find the one person who's so easily missed. Jesus sees this poor widow as she's sliding through the people trying to go to an offering box, take out two small copper coins. And these coins, as the text say, only equal out to one penny, which in antiquity is less than a day's wage. And he watched her move her way through the crowd towards the box with that small amount. The significance of this scene, we, can't, we just can't miss it. We have to sit in it. There's another scene in Mark's gospel where Jesus mentions another unnamed woman for all that she gave as well. You'll see it in chapter 14 when we get there. But the question is, is Jesus interested in her money or is it something more? As we see in verse 43, he calls his disciples now to himself. So he's went from the crowd to his disciples, those who are the most intimate with him, those who follow him, those who have gave up everything at the beginning of Mark to come and follow me. So he's speaking to his people when he talks about this woman. He says to his disciples that this woman has put in more than anyone else. And it's at this moment that it's obvious on a material basis with all the large sums, with all of the things that have been put in by the rich that she has not put in materially more. So what is more? 
It's with this answer, like any answer Jesus gives, he turns upside down the reality of the world's system and shows us the reality of the kingdom's system. This widow is now in starch contrast to the rich in the court, but she's also in starch contrast to the scribes. Jesus isn't interested in the portion. He's interested in the proportion. You see what the scribes did in verses 38 through 40 is self-serving. It's about themselves and keeping things for themselves. And in 41 through 44, we have this unnoticed poor widow who holds nothing back. She is loving the Lord her God with all her heart, with all her soul, with all her mind, and with all her strength. Even when it costs her everything. So what does Jesus desire of you, of me, of his church? He desires all of us. Everything. How can Jesus then desire all of me, of you? What's so powerful about the poor widow's gift isn't her moral example, though it is extremely commendable. It's the window to which we can see through her to the very heart of Jesus, to the heart of God. See, there's a story being told through this widow a story of a God who before the foundations of the world set his heart on holding nothing back. A God who promised to one day crush the head of the enemy. A God who showed himself faithful to free his people from bondage, to look after the orphan, the widow, and the most vulnerable among him. And time and time again, when his people would sin and sin against him, he would pursue until one day he did something he'd never done before. God crossed the barrier. God became a man, became God incarnate. He walked among the broken and the sinful. And as he moved among us, He had one thing on his mind, and that was to empty himself, to redeem that which seemed unredeemable. See, in the same way that this woman didn't save one little piece of her wage, Jesus didn't go one quarter of the way to the cross. The same way this woman didn't save half her wage, Jesus didn't halfway go to the cross. The same way this woman didn't give three quarters of her wage, or save three quarters of her wage, Jesus didn't three quarters of the way go to the cross. He went all the way. He gave all he had to live on. He gave his life. Jesus held nothing back. He gave all he had for you, for me, for his church. Why wouldn't you go all in with him? So at the beginning of this sermon, I spoke of the confusing messages of the world around us has of the church. But when the church, when we don't see Jesus as he is, or be aware of our pride, or only give part of us rather than all of us, the effects can be corroding and eroding over time. As Jesus closes out his interactions in the temple, he sets his face towards the cross, and Mark wants to communicate one simple yet profound truth to Emmanuel Church in 2022 here in Nashville, Tennessee, and that is Jesus is God. He is holding nothing back from us. So why don't we give all of ourselves to him? 
You see, the beauty of this text shows us that Jesus, despite all of our attempts to co-opt him, stands on his own. He's calling all of those in need to come to him, and he's creating a kingdom, as singer John Guerrero writes, where blessed are the poor who have nothing to own. Blessed are the mourners who are crying alone. Blessed are the guilty who have nowhere to go, for their hearts have a road to the kingdom of God, and their souls are the songs of the kingdom of God, and they will find a refuge, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, we hold ourselves before you our need, everything, and we ask that you would take all of us. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.